I, I want you to know that in 40 years, preparing this particular message was the single most difficult message in my life. And here's the reason. Because in my mind, I really wanted to share with you all of the major lessons that I've learned in 40 years. So you don't have to make some of the mistakes I made and you don't have to go through some of the pain that I went through uh, because I care about you and it's wiser to learn from somebody else than have to go through everything by experience. So I sat down, the first thing I did this week is I made a list of all the major lessons I've learned about God and life in 40 years. I came up with 52 lessons and I thought, that's a year's sermon series, 52 weeks. There's no way. And I just thought, Rick, you are the dumbest person on the planet to think you could sh summarize 40 years in one sermon. So I had to just take one principle because I knew we weren't gonna have a whole lot of time this weekend. I just wanna take one principle and, and nail down on that. And it's there, if you'll pull out your message notes, it's how God grows our faith. If you get this one, it's so important uh, and, and because the Bible says this, look on your outline. You know, one day the apostles are, are walking along, the disciples are walking with Jesus and they say in Luke chapter 17, verse five, they said, Lord, increase our faith. That is a prayer God will always answer. Lord, increase our faith. Now, why did they pray increase our faith? Well, there are many, many reasons, but let me just mention two, the next two verses. First, Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's why you want your faith to increase, because without faith, it is impossible to please God. God does not respond to my complaints. God does not uh, respond to my worries. God does not respond to my uh, uh, bitterness or whatever, but God moves heaven and earth when I trust him. He always responds to faith. And, and, and the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. Not only that, faith is the door to everything God wants to do in your life. The door to your future, and we're gonna do a series on doors to your future. And time to dream again uh, in a couple weeks, a new, new series. But in Matthew 9, 29, Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done to you. You get to choose how much I bless your life. According to your faith, I will do it. God responds to faith. You put a little faith in God, you'll get little results. You put a lot of faith in God, you get a lot of results. You put great faith in God, you'll get great results. That's one of the most important lessons I've learned in 40 years is that according to your faith, it will be done unto you. God says, you get to choose how much I bless your life. Now, Colossians 2.7 says this. Let your roots go down into him and draw up nourishment so that you will grow in faith. Circle that, grow in faith. Strong and vigorous. For 40 years, that has been my goal as your coach, as your pastor, as, as a spiritual leader in helping you. My goal is that you will grow in faith and that your faith will be strong and your faith will be vigorous. Not some wimpy, namby-pamby faith that, that burns up when the heat's on, but strong, vigorous faith. That's my goal for you. You say, well, Rick, how does God do that? How does God grow my faith? Well, in two big categories, write these down the two ways God grows your faith. The first way God grows your faith is through knowing God's word, knowing God's word. That's actually the easy way. It's God's favorite way for you to learn faith. He wants you to read the Bible, listen to the Bible, study the Bible, memorize the Bible, talk about the Bible, because the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing, hearing God's message, and God's message is heard through the word of Christ. So. Uh, um, I, I can grow in faith every time I read this book. If your faith is weak, it means this. You're not in this book very often. The more you're in this book, whether you listen to it on tape or MP3 or you read it, uh, the more you get in this book, the more, this is your soul food, it feeds your soul. And, and some of you have been on a fast for a long time, you haven't been feeding. And so your faith isn't very strong, it's pretty weak. That's the easy way to grow in faith. But even if you studied the Bible four hours a day, and you don't, that would still leave 20 hours a day that you're not studying it. So God actually depends more on the second way to grow your faith 
than he does the first. The first doing is the easy way. The second way is the hard way. Well, how's the second way? God grows my faith through circumstances that test me. God grows my faith through circumstances that test me. And while you might only read the Bible for a little bit every day, you have circumstances 24 hours a day, so God depends actually more on the second way to grow your faith and grow your character than he does on the first. Now, faith is like a muscle. And the only way you grow a muscle is by stretching it, by testing it, putting some weight on it, by putting some resistance. You don't grow muscle without resistance. You don't grow muscle without it being stretched. You don't grow muscle without it being um, uh, uh, you know, tested by a weight or uh, some kind of exercise of some kind. The same is true with faith. You don't grow a faith just by sitting around and saying, oh, I want more faith. You gotta have it tested, it's gotta be stretched, it's gotta be pushed. And that's why God allows these circumstances that, that test and stretch my faith. What I wanna do, and I could have given you 14 or 20 uh, uh, faith steps or tests, let me just give you four. These are four that I have seen over and over and over and over in the last 40 years. So I know they're gonna come up in your life repeatedly, that if you're gonna grow in faith, God is gonna say, learn the word, but also be realized that I'm gonna use test to strengthen, to stretch, to build, to grow, to develop your muscle, your faith muscle. Okay, what are these four tests that we're gonna look at? Number one, God tests and grows our faith through dreams. God tests and grows our faith through dreams. You say, what do you mean by that, Rick? I'm saying that God gives you a dream in your heart he gives you a vision in your mind of what he wants to do with your life. And this is a test. Everybody's had a dream at some point in their life. Everybody's had a dream. Where do you think that dream came from? It came from God. And God gives us different dreams so everything gets done in the world. If we all like to do the same thing, a lot would get left undone. So the things that you're interested in, the things that you're passionate about, there's some things that turn your crank. There's some things you couldn't care less about. Where do you think you got that? You got it from God. God made you to be you. He doesn't want you to be me. You're not responsible for the dream God gave me. You're responsible for the dream that God gives you. Now, there's a big difference between God's dream for your life and your dream. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. But by the way, how do you know if a dream's from God? How do I know? Did I just make this up? Or, or did it really come from God? So how do you know a dream is from God? Two ways, one, it's gonna help somebody. If your dream doesn't help somebody, it's not from God. Because God is not interested in just you living a self-centered life. Does that make sense? God is interested in you living a self-centered life. So what every dream you give you, it's gonna help somebody out there, either a product or a service or an idea or a thought, or a book, or a service of some kind that you give, you make somebody's life brighter, you make somebody's life more beautiful, you make somebody's life greater, easier, whatever. It's gonna help somebody else, that's the first thing. The other one is, listen, it'll be so big, that you're bound to fail, unless God bails you out. When God gives you a dream, you can't do it in your own power. It is so big, that you're, you go, there's no way I could do that. And God's going, right, that's why you're gonna have to depend on me. Because if you don't have to depend on me, you don't need any faith, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. So God will give you a dream that A, is gonna help somebody out there in some way. There's a need for it, find a need and fill it. You know, find a hurt and heal it. Uh, I, I, oh, and number two, it, it's a dream that's gonna be so big, you can't do it uh, on, on your own power. Now here's what the Bible says, Jeremiah 29, 11. Very famous verse. God says, I know what I've planned for you, says the Lord. I have good plans for you. I don't plan to hurt you. I plan to give you hope and a good future. This whole thing, Saddleback Church, started because God put a dream in my heart, in my mind. Kay and I, when we got married, we actually thought we were gonna be missionaries somewhere in Asia. And we were ready to go. But God shut the door. And it was the biggest disappointment in my life. 
I had already been a, a, a short-term missionary to Japan, lived in Nagasaki, taught English to help plant a church in Nagasaki. I thought we were going back to Asia. She did too. And God shut that door. God guides you not just through open doors. We're going to look at that in the next couple weeks in this new series. But he also guides you through shut doors. God slammed that one shut. And I thought, I don't get it. When so, many, so few people are willing to go to overseas, and we are, why don't you let us go? And God said, you're not going to be a missionary, but you're going to be a missionary sending church, and you'll send out thousands. So I remember getting out a map of the United States. We were living in Texas at the time. I was working on my master's degree, and uh, I put up a map of the U.S., and I circled every major city outside of the South. Detroit, New York, Philadelphia, Albuquerque, Denver, Phoenix. Finally narrowed down to four areas on the West Coast. Seattle, San Francisco, San Diego, and Orange County. I was in the South at the time. I thought, man, there are plenty of churches here. I'm going to go where there aren't enough churches. So I studied Seattle, San Francisco, San Diego, Orange County. And one day, that summer, 1979, I discovered, reading census statistics, that this area, the Saddleback Valley where Lake Forest campus is, was the fastest growing area in Orange County. And, or and Orange County was the fastest growing county in the United States between 1970 and 1980. That's not true anymore. But I thought, wherever you got a lot of people moving in, they're gonna need churches. So most of you know this story that I wrote a letter to a, a, a guy who was a, kind of a director of Baptist churches in the area. I was going to a Baptist seminary. I wrote the guy and I said, um, I'm not asking you for money, I'm not asking you for support, uh, but I'm thinking about coming to the Saddleback Valley to start a new church. And I just like your opinion. His name was Herman Wooten. And I wrote that letter to him, not knowing that somehow in the province of God, he had heard that I was interested in planning a church. And he had written to me. And it, it, as a seminary student, he said, uh, dear Mr. Warren, we'd never met, he said, uh, I've heard you may be interested in planning a church. Have you ever considered a place called the Saddleback Valley? And our letters crossed in the mail. <laughs> I put my letter in one day, and the next day I went to the, to the uh, mailbox, opened it up, and there's a letter from the guy I just written a letter to. No, and he probably just got mine that day. And I burst it into tears. And that started giving me a little sign that I was on to the dream that God wanted me to do. And, and, and so, bottom line is, um, we, um, I, I went around to some churches and tried to get some support. Nobody would support me. At that time, nobody would support me. So I said, okay, Kay, um, here's the thing. Uh, I think God is calling us to move to a city we've never been to and start a new church with no money and no members, and, and no building, and I've never been a senior pastor. What do you think? <laughs> and uh, she did what you did, she laughed. <laughs> Actually, then she said, she looked at me and said, well, it scares me to death. It scares me to death. But I believe in God, and I believe in you, so let's go for it. I've often thought, how would history be different if my wife had said no? There would be no celebrate recovery. There'd be no purpose driven life. There'd be no Daniel plan. There'd be no peace plan. There'd be no 55,000 people baptized and headed into heaven. There would be no purpose driven church ministry that's trained over a million pastors. None of that would have happened. There would not be the book that is the best selling book in American history and just past 50 million copies. It's the most translated book in the world. It's in Guinness, purpose driven life. None of that would have happened. I just want to pause here and say, when somebody has a dream, make sure you're not the dream buster. Because you may be thwarting the will of God. You just ought to be pretty careful about that. So when Kay gets dreams, I'm going, God, don't let me get in the way. <laughs> and I, I, I support her in what God is saying to her in the same way. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't have dreams because um, because it's scary. Well, of course it's scary. That's why it requires faith. Every single decision, major decision I've made in 40 years as pastor of this church, big, big decisions, sometimes involving tens of millions of dollars, 
Every single one of them scared me to death. I just decided a long time ago, I'm not gonna base my life on fear. We're gonna do the thing that, fears, that we fear. We're not gonna let fear dominate our lives. That's what courage is. If you're not afraid, you don't need courage. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is when you do what you know God's told you to do, even though you're scared to death. And when we went in debt for 120 acres in Orange County, and everybody's going, yeah, what kind of church does that? Well, to me, it was just a bunch of zeros. Well, add a few more on. I don't, can't tell the difference between a million or 20 million. <laughs> But it's just trusting God, moving ahead in your fear. Now, a lot of people think, well, I'm not gonna go after my dream because I don't have a peace about it. You're not gonna have a peace about it until you take the step. God doesn't give you the peace before you take the move. You're waiting for him to give you the peace. Now, he's not gonna give it to you. Of course you got, you got fears. But you make the move and you step into the water and you watch the waves part and then the peace comes. It was only after I got here and I started seeing miracles in the early months of Saddleback Church. I, I grew up in a little town of 500 people in Northern California called Redwood Valley. It's, it's in the Redwoods, 500 people. Okay, that's this section right here, okay? <laughs> So this church is a million times bigger than, 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 the, than the church that I pastor. And I'll never forget, we were coming in from, from Texas and we're getting here right in the middle of rush hour traffic, which I don't understand why they call it rush hour when it's the slowest time of the year, uh, uh, day. And we're coming in on 91, Riverside, which 18 lanes and it's jam packed, it's a parking lot. And I'm from a town of 500 people and I looked around and go, God, you got the wrong guy. What in the world am I doing here? But I had a dream. So we pull off the off ramp. I find the first real estate office I could find. I walk in, it's late in the day, about 4.30 in the afternoon. Only one realtor in there, Don Dale. And I say, hi, Don goes, I'm Don, how can I help you? I said, well, my name's Rick Warren. Uh, I'm 25 years old, um, uh, I'm, I'm here to start a church. Um, I have no money, I have no buildings, I have no members, I have no salary, and I need a place to live. <laughs> and he just laughed. Where God guides, God provides. And he said, well, let's see what we can do. So he looks around, he finds this little condo, and somehow Don gets this guy to give us the first month rent free, because I had no money, and nothing down. I never heard of such a thing, but Don just goes, I think the guy's legit, I think you can trust this, this kid. Uh, and, and so we got it, nothing down and, 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 uh, and no rent the first month, so had, didn't have to pay it up front. We were literally gonna stay in the truck that night because we didn't even have money for a motel. We were moving on faith, but God had given a dream and God tests you with a dream. I'll never forget, a couple days later, I get a phone call. We'd been here just a couple days, and I picked the phone and said, hello? I wasn't expecting anybody to call, nobody knew me. The guy says, is this Rick Warren? Yeah, he said, are you the young guy down in South Orange County starting a church? Yeah. He goes, well, I somehow heard about your name. He said, my name is Bill Grady. I'm an Episcopalian priest up in Fullerton. I said, well, it's nice to meet you, Bill, what can I do? He said, I feel led, God's told me to pay your salary for the first two months. Hello? You are my new best friend, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. And God took care of us, why? Because with a dream. Tom started to read the original dream. That when we started that little Bible study of seven people and it grew to about 15 in the first 12 weeks and I said, we're gonna start on Easter Sunday because if anybody comes, they're gonna come on Easter. They may not come back the second week but I'll at least ask the people to go visit. So I said the week before, we're gonna go down to Laguna Hills High School and, and, and we're gonna practice, the 15 of us. We're gonna pretend like there's a church here, like 60 people or 100 people here. We're just making up a number. And uh, we'll go down, we'll, we'll practice, work out all the bugs. So next week on Easter, 
when people show up, if anybody shows up, we, it looks like we know what we're doing. Then we hand addressed and hand, I wrote a letter to the community after we visited homes for 12 weeks. And I hand addressed and hand stamped, 15 of us hand addressed and hand stamped 15,000 letters. Mailed them out 10 days before Easter and it said, at last a new church for those who've given up on traditional churches. I had in that small group of 15 people, most of them were non-believers. I had non-believers helping start this church, which was really cool because then they knew what would attract them. <laughs> what would you guys like? Some people got that letter early, misread it. it. Came a week early, we had 60 people to trial run service and five gave their lives to Christ. <laughs> I wanted to get up and say, no, no, you can't do that this week. You gotta wait till Easter next week. We're, this, we're just practicing this week. But five people came to Christ at the dress rehearsal. The next Sunday, I'm standing on the patio of Lagoon Hills High School, and I watch 205 strangers that I've never met walk up and come to Saddleback's first service. And I looked at Kay, Kay's got tears in her eyes, and I have tears in my eyes, I go, this is gonna work. Where God guides, God provides. God, what is the dream you're afraid to go after? What is the dream that you're afraid to start? At that trial run service, not Easter, this is the famous dream that I read 40 years ago. And I audaciously announced this in faith. What is Saddleback Church? What is it gonna be in the years ahead? It is a dream of a place where the hurting, the depressed, the frustrated, the confused can find love and acceptance and health and hope and forgiveness and encouragement and guidance. It is the dream of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with hundreds of thousands of residents in South Orange County. It is the dream of welcoming 20,000 members into the fellowship of God's family loving, learning, and living in harmony together. Now I'm saying this to 60 strangers. You might call that chutzpah. I call it faith. It is the dream of developing people to spiritual maturity through Bible studies and seminars and retreats and small groups and a Bible school for our members. It is a dream of equipping every member for significant ministry, their ministry in the world, by helping them discover their gifts and talents that God gave them. It is a dream of sending out hundreds of missionaries and church leaders all around the world and empowering every member for their personal life mission in the world. It is the dream of sending out our members by the thousands on short-term projects to every continent. I'm saying this to 60 people. It is a dream of starting at least one daughter church a year. It is a dream of owning at least 50 acres of land. And on this will be built a regional church for Southern California with beautiful yet simple and efficient facilities, including a worship center seating thousands, a counseling center, classrooms for Bible study, training and prayer, and recreation areas all designed to minister to the total person, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and set in a peaceful garden landscape, with bright flowers, beautiful trees, every single tree on this property we planted. When we got this property, it was a moonscape of a gravel pit. There was nothing living on this planet, on this, this site. <laughs> mm, it looked like Tatooine, if you know what I mean and set in a peaceful, inspiring garden landscape with bright flowers and beautiful trees and pools of water, sparkling fountains and flowing streams. I stand before you today, this is 40 years ago, and I stayed in confident faith and assurance that these dreams will become a reality. Why? Because they were inspired by God, by God. Now friends, that dream has been fulfilled. Everything on that list has been fulfilled, okay? And God, God has been faithful, but you ain't seen nothing yet. The most exciting part of a race is not the start. 
The most exciting part of a race is not the middle. The most exciting part of the race is making it to the finish line, and we're not there yet. So we're all here at just the right time, okay? I can remember some of the discouraging times. The future, in the last 10 days of Saddleback Church, God has given me a little warning here. In the last 10 days, we've had over 300 people give their lives to Christ in our church. In the last 10 days, I have baptized over 800 and, I don't know what it is, 50 something, 60 something, Last, last Saturday night, I was in the baptism pool four hours. Sunday, I was in it from nine to four, 11 hours. Thursday night, I was here baptizing till 10 p.m. We are having a harvest, a revival, unlike any other time in our history. All of our best days are ahead of us. In the last 10 days, 2,669 people have joined Saddleback Church. 10 days. I'm saying, you got here just at the right time. It's gonna get really exciting. All of our best days are ahead of us. So next week, I'm gonna share the 2020 vision of where we're going. Now, I'm already out of time and I did one point. It's, and I, I thought I'd teach you 40 years of lessons in one sermon. You guys, it's time for true confessions, 40 years, if you haven't figured this one out. I have really good sense of space. You can drop me down in any city in the world and I'll know which way to go. I just have an internal gyroscope. I have no sense of time. Have you noticed that? <laughs> <laughs> My, how time flies, all right? All right, I tell you what. I will give you the fill-ins and won't teach you and tell you the stories. Please beg me. Okay, one more point. I'll give you two. I'll give you two. Then we'll just have to teach the rest of us later, okay? Oh, first, let me just say this. <laughs> Look at this verse, Ephesians 3.20. God can do anything you know far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. Here's the thing. Don't let the size of your God determine the size of your dream. Don't make the dream based on what you think you can do. That's going to be a pretty small dream. Make the dream based on what you think God can do. Now, I don't have to belabor this point because in three weeks, we're gonna start Time to Dream. Time to Dream is the next spiritual growth campaign. You know, we do one every year. And you gotta be in a small group to, to get all this material. Uh, but if you're a host, you can go out tonight and start getting it for your small group. If you're not in a group, we'll help you start one. And what I've already taped, the time to dream, opening the doors to your future. This is a six week video series and here's the book. And we're gonna have probably eight, 9,000 small groups go through this material for six weeks after the party in a couple weeks. Time to dream. I'm going, what I wanna do is I wanna set you up for this decade. I wanna teach you how to dream great dreams. I wanna teach you how to make the rest of your life the best of your life. If it's not gonna be the best of your life, God should just take you on to heaven right now. If you're not gonna use it. You are most like your creator when you're creative. And yet most people don't know how to really dream and then what to do with the dream. So we're gonna study it for six weeks in the small groups. And everybody who's in a small group is gonna get a free copy of this, my new book called Open Doors. And it's 365 daily devotionals for the next year. This is for everybody who's in a small group. Now, you can't buy this in a store, you can't buy it on Amazon, you only get it by being in a small group. Na 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 na. Okay. 
So, how many of you have been through a spiritual growth campaign at Saddleback before? Can I see your hands? Yeah, almost everybody. I want to ask you to consider something. We got a lot of new people. This year, I want to ask if maybe one of the most unselfish things you could do would be to go to your group, attend your group with this stuff, and then host a different group for new people for six weeks. Now that would mean you'd have to do two nights a week, but only for six weeks. I'm not asking you to do it forever. I'm just saying, I, I, I've been through this. I know what a small group is like. I know what our small, maybe you could go to your group on one day and then help start a new one uh, for new folks in our, in our church. If you're a host or you wanna be a host, you can go out to the table and start and get this stuff. We'll get you set up with a pack for, uh, for uh, this thing. But that's gonna start in a couple weeks. And there's all kinds of information on there. Do you remember what a host is? H-O-S-T? H, have to like people. If you're grumpy, you can't be a host. You have to really like, oh, oh, open up your home or your office or Starbucks or someplace. S, serve them something to drink. Coffee, tea, Coke, whatever. And T, turn on the DVD player. If you can do that, you can be a host. You can be 99 years old and be a host. You can be a teenager and be a host. Right now we have about 8,000 hosts. We need about at least 1,000 more for all the people in our, in our church now. Okay, let me give you the second point and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Because there's all kinds of songs I wanted to sing. <laughs> second big test. God tests and grows our faith, not just through dreams, but through delays. God tests and grows our faith through delays. No dream is instantly fulfilled. All those things that I wrote down in that first day, it took 40 years. It didn't happen the next day. Here's the biggest problem you, you, you do. You set your goals too low and you try to accomplish them too quickly. We underestimate, we overestimate what we can do in a year but we underestimate what we could do in 10 or 20. What I wanna challenge you, and during this dream series, I'm gonna be hitting on this hard. Set bigger goals, bigger dreams for your life, and then give the rest of your life to it. Stop playing in, in, in the shallows of Baby Beach. Stop splashing around on Baby Beach with little dinky, tiny goals. Make your life count. I can teach you, I can teach you how to do something great with your life. I cannot teach you how to do it quickly. It takes time. It took me 40 years. But inch by inch, anything's a cinch. How do you, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Doesn't happen overnight. When God wants to make a mushroom, he takes six hours. When God wants to make an oak tree, he takes 60 years. Do you want to be a mushroom or an oak tree? Now, I don't know how much time you've got left. 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 10 years, you don't know. I'm just saying that the most important thing in your life is not the duration of your life, but the donation of your life. What matters most is not how long you live. What matters is how you live. And if God brought you here to this world-class church changing people around the world, he means you have something he wants to use. You have talents, you have abilities that he wants to use for a greater purpose than yourself. So just get on the train and let's go together. But it won't all happen at once. Here's what the Bible says, Habakkuk 2.3. These things that I plan for you, these good plans that Jeremiah talked about, they won't happen right away. But steadily, slowly, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, do not despair, for these things will surely be fulfilled. Just be patient, they will surely come to pass. Just be patient, they will not be overdue a single day. I might be able to give you 
a hundred examples, stories in the last 40 years of how God used delays in the life of our church and in my own life personally to actually get us to a better place. If God has given you a dream and it hadn't come to true yet, don't despair. The delays are part of the process. The obstacles are part of the journey because God is building your faith. He's strengthening that muscle. He's testing you and he builds your faith through not just dreams that are scary, but delays that take time. There's always a delay between the dream and the fulfillment. And one of the things I want you to learn that I've learned over 40 years is that God's timing is always, always perfect. He's never early. Sometimes I thought he was late, but he wasn't. He knew what he was doing. What do you do while you're waiting on your dream? Well, you remember this basic truth. God is in control. In a minute, we're gonna close this service by singing that song. It's been a theme song of Saddleback for 40 years. God is in control. It's something you have to remember in the delays and the difficulties and the dead ends of life. God is in control in all of the details. The Bible says there on, on your outline, on the back, Isaiah 64, verse four, God acts on the behalf, God acts on the behalf of those who, what? Circle that, wait for him. God acts on the behalf of those who wait for him. God has acted on my behalf countless times because I waited on him. I waited on his timing. I had the dream way, way in advance, but God's timing of the fulfillment of it was gonna happen in his timing. <clears throat> so what am I saying? Never let an impossible situation intimidate you, keep you from your dream. Never let an impossible situation intimidate you. Let it motivate you. Motivate you to pray more, to believe more, to trust more, to wait more, to expect more, to depend on God more. Because when you do that, it is inevitable. What God starts in your life, he's gonna finish. Let it motivate you to believe, to trust more and more and more. Now the Bible says nothing is impossible to God. So you got a dream, but it hadn't happened yet. We're gonna talk about this for six weeks. But what we're gonna look at is the fact, Hudson Taylor said it like this. He's a famous missionary. He said, there are three phases to God's work. Impossible, possible, and done. You may be in what looks like the impossible stage right now, but it's gonna get to the possible, and then it's gonna get done. You've heard me tell this many times that if you were to come to my office and take my dictionary out of my office and look up the word impossible, you would find it's not there because I cut it out with an exacto knife. Because <laughs> if God says nothing is impossible, if that word isn't in his vocabulary, it's not in mine. Nothing is impossible with God. Satan's favorite phrase in your life, do you know what it is? You can't do that. You can't do that. Who do you think you are? You know your past. What makes you think you could be a man of God? The promises of God. What makes you think you could be a woman of God? Every, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. That's what this church is all about. Doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what direction your feet have been, what matters is what direction your feet are headed right now. So I invite you to join us. In the next decade, it's gonna be our greatest decade. I want your life to be an embarrassment to the devil. I want our church family together as a family, brothers and sisters, I want our church family to be an embarrassment of the devil. I want him to think, Saddleback, oh, I hate those guys. 
All they know how to do is just trust God. They believe him for the impossible. They go after big goals. They do things that nobody else even attempts or even thinks about doing. Why? They're stupid enough to trust God. Yep. That's exactly right. So I'm asking you, give your life to Christ. Get connected to a family. Get connected to this family. We welcome you here, but just find a church and make the rest of your life count. Count. 